Uh, I will try and speak slowly. Um, I tend to speak quite quickly, so if I do speak too fast, try and give me a signal to slow me down, okay? All right. Uh, so I'm Graham. I'm the founder of a company in the UK called Player Research. Um, as you can guess from the name, we research players. Who would have thought? So um, I was an ac academic, so I was a, a lecturer, an academic in the UK at Sussex University. Um, similar position to Mark is. And I taught human-computer interaction. But my research was in video games. So why are video games good? And how come some people spend hundreds of millions of dollars to make a video game? And you buy it and pick it up and you say, oh, it's rubbish. And you say that within minutes sometimes. How can that happen? How can this company spend so much money and time to create something fun for you and yet you don't like it? Why, why does that happen? Why is it too confusing? So I left academia and started this company in 2012. Um, today, uh, this, uh, or last year, 2017, we work on about 80 games per year. Um, and most of these games are the games at the top of the charts. So it's games you've probably played. We're the company, or one of the companies, doing the research behind the world's leading video games at the minute to try and make those games better for you, better for the player. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Does anyone here play video games? On mobile, on... Oh, no, let, let me ask the opposite. Does anyone not play video games or think of themselves as not a video gamer? Okay, 100%. Everyone plays some sort of game. Okay. Quick show, who's mainly a mobile game player? So Android, iOS, iPad. Really? No? <laughs> no? No, no. Who plays on console? PlayStation, Xbox? Okay, quite a lot. Quite a lot. Wow. All the gamers over this side. Right. <laughs> What's that? It's like a majority. It is. Yeah, yeah, majority cons. Uh, PC. Okay. Okay, I see. I see. All right. That's, that's good, good to know. I thought the PC was dying, but obviously not, not, not in Spain. That's fine. Um, Okay, so what I'm trying to show today, I'm not going to talk about the games we work on because that's private knowledge to those games companies. But the sort of games we do work on is like FIFA 18, if anyone's played that, or Arena of Valor, um, or I'll maybe show a slide later on of some of the games. So they're the world's top games that we're trying to make even better. And what I'm going to show today is a very lighthearted look. So I'm going to take some good video games and show the mistakes they made. Now, it's very easy to pick a terrible game and show you the mistakes they made. That's very, very easy. But I'm not going to do that. It's quite the opposite. I'm going to take a games that are making, well, lots, millions of dollars. They've got lots of players. And even those games are full of UX or user experience mistakes. And we're just going to show some of them and ask the question, why? How come they make a great game but still don't understand people very well? Or interaction design? or information architecture, or UI even, the sim simpler stuff. Why do those things happen? And if, if all of you are making software, games or apps, or mobile apps, whatever it may be, how could you do it better? Um, so that's the sort of things we're going to, going to look at. By the way, when I say UX, I almost certainly mean UX research. So UX comes in two main flavors, uh, UX design and UX research. I'm a UX researcher. I don't really design anything. But my company and the people in the company, we assess the games. We do the research on the games. So we don't come up with the idea or come up with any of the interaction or the UI, but we evaluate it. We try and understand it. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. I'm a UX researcher. My company does UX research. And I know there's a bit of a blurry line between UX design and research. It's not quite clear cut. But most of the things we do are understanding. Why do you not like something? Why do you not understand? OK, so what are we going to look at? There's some examples. Um, Cuphead. Has anyone played Cuphead on PC? OK, good, 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 good. If not, don't worry about it. It's fine. We'll describe it. Um, we're going to look at some base builders on mobile, mobile devices. Anyone playing Clash of Clans or Boom Beach? Or a couple? OK. Oh, yeah, more than a couple. Good, 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 good. And then we'll look at some, uh, another PC game as well. So try, I'm trying to show you a variety. 
some console, some PC, some mobile. And they're all making these mistakes. All these games could be even better. That, that's what we're trying to say. So this is Cuphead. It was released last year, and it's a very successful game. They've sold millions of copies. The reviews are very good indeed. People like this game. It's a very difficult game, and it's meant to be. That's what the designers wanted. But still, it contains some issues. And you may or may not have seen this issue. Um, this is a games journalist called Dean Takahashi. He writes for Polygon or The Verge or both, I think. Um, he's got 21 years experience in games journalism. So he's obviously a very experienced uh, critique of video games uh, and playing games. And when he tried to play Cuphead, he got stuck on the tutorial. And the internet did not give him a very nice time. They said very nasty things about Dean, uh, saying, how come this guy with 21 years experience can't even do the tutorial to a video game? How can this guy possibly critique a video game if he can't play it? Now that's interesting. How, how can that be possible? This is a very experienced gamer, but he struggled with the tutorial. Isn't that odd? The tutorial is meant to teach you how to play the game. It's not meant to be, it's not meant to be difficult. So I'm going to show you the very clip that went on the internet that you know, embarrassed this poor guy. And I'm trying to say that I do, I do not think this guy's an idiot. I do not think it's his fault. I think it's the game designer's fault for not doing a better job. But what, what I was surprised about is nobody blamed the game designers. When this guy struggled and couldn't do or couldn't play the tutorial, nobody said, oh, the game design's bad. Everyone said, the player's rubbish. Everybody blamed the player. Why would you do that? Why would you blame the player, but not the creator? That seems odd, no? If you're in user experience, because you always say that you, it's never the user's fault. Never. If someone is struggling to use something, it was designed wrong. Now, I know the internet's the internet. I know, I know, right. But what I was interested in, nobody defended him. or that it, No one said it's not his fault. Everyone said that this is this guy's fault. So, I want to show you the video uh, from the the tutorial, and it lasts about two or three minutes, and it's painful to watch, it's embarrassing, and I'm going to make you watch it all, to make you feel the guy's pain. Um, also, I want you to look at when the guy struggles, when he fails to do this, I want you to study this and say, why? What are the reasons? I will give you the answer at the end, but I want you to think, if you were designing this tutorial, what would you have changed? Why is this guy struggling? so much. Okay, so Cuphead, if you have not played it, it's a 2D platforming game, and it's meant to be difficult. But again, the tutorial is not usually meant to be difficult. However, let's see. So here we go. Duck down, he practices that, that's good. So this is where the problem starts. Well, this is the problem. Clearly, he's meant to somehow jump over this, this block. It looks easy enough. And yet. Are you feeling the pain yet? Feeling it? Yeah, OK. This is a guy with 21 years games journalism experience. He obviously knows games. So as researchers, as people who study the, the link between the interaction and the human, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Clearly there's something on this screen that's suggesting that he's doing the right thing. He thinks he's doing the right thing, but it's not working. Oh, so close, so close. No, no. More pain, more pain. Imagine how he feels. The internet's, oh, there we go. Success. 
So this part's not too bad. Shoot and locking the, the direction of shooting. He gets this quite quickly. But his problems are not over. Have a look at this. So he's meant to get to the end and then go up here. And he fails. Not correct. Back to the start. Fails again. Back to the start. Why is this happening? There, all the information you need is on the screen to answer the question. Well, arguably. Success. There are some problems here, but we'll talk about it later. So he's at the end. So quite painful, clearly. This guy does not do a brilliant job of navigating the tutorial. And maybe most of you in this room did not see any of these problems. And that's fine. So if you're a better gamer or you, well, we'll see in a second. If you interpret these instructions differently, you will never see the problems. But that's user experience research. That's why we bring in different people. Because some people will have no problem. Some people will have lots of problems. And this guy happened to have lots of problems. So what went wrong? Let's go back to the start. Um, the first thing, arguably, is this instruction. It says jump. And it looks innocent enough. Tap for short, hold for high jump. So what's the problem there? It's told you, tap or hold. One's short, one's long. Well, one of the problems is um, hold for high jump. How high is high? It doesn't really tell you that. All you know is there's two levels. I tap or I hold, and one's higher than the other. And you'll see why that, in conjunction with another problem, uh, may cause an issue. So, for example, this is short and this is high. And the instruction says, tap for short, hold for long. So the visual reinforcement looks as if, well, if I hold, I will jump up here and I will, I will move on. That's kind of what this instruction is implying. But it's not true. It's not true. Uh, if you hold the button, you will jump higher, but you will not jump high enough to get up here. And that's why you saw the guy trying multiple times. He thought he was doing the right thing. So kind of a poor instruction. Um, is it enough of a problem on its own? No, but it's not great. What about this one? The second instruction you see in the game. Dash. Well, you're, a lot of you seem to be video gamers, and that's fine. But the dash instruction only appears in certain games. You don't see a dash mechanic in lots of, lots of game genres. So if you haven't played a game before which has a dash mechanic, you won't know what that means. This word dash will mean nothing to you. Uh, it's possible that many of you have never played a, a video game with a dash mechanic in it, because only some of them have it. So this is assumed knowledge. This assumes, oh, you're playing a 2D platformer, and maybe you know what dash is. But if you don't, that is a blocker for you. That will be a problem. The second problem with this instruction, it says, quick evade on ground or air. But there's nothing here to evade. It's a bad example. A lot of video games do this. They teach you to do something, but there's no need to do it. You only need to evade if there's something there. But in this case, in this example, there's nothing. It's a very poor example of how to teach the player. So this, this simple instruction, it looks minor. Oh, yeah, yeah, just hit, hit Y and we'll dash. It's full of problems. You have to know what dash means. And it's only telling you to do it if you want to evade something. And in fact, there's nothing to evade here. So maybe you don't need to push the button at all. You do, but the player may think they don't. So again, is it enough of a problem on its own? Maybe not. The other problem is this, uh, this jump instruction. To actually clear this, as you saw, you have to jump on this block first of all. So you can't stand here and jump up. You have to stand here uh, and then jump to the second block. That seems simple enough. But you have to guess that. You have to somehow know that 
when I clear this, when I jump over it, I have to use it again a second time. This is a very minor issue, very, very small. But you saw him jump over it and expect to jump to the next one immediately, which isn't true. He had to go back and use a previous item. So it's really, really minor. Have to, uh, sometimes called chaining. So you have to use one item to succeed in a second step. But he didn't do it. He did not do that. Let's go back a little bit. Um, anything other, any other issues? I think we've covered them all. So most of the issues in this screen, we'll see it later on, they're quite minor. But when, they, when they're combined, that's when problems start in video games. You, don't, you shouldn't look at each issue individually. That's not necessarily the whole problem. It's only when they combine and you see the complete picture that stop this guy from completing. You saw this parry slap as well. Uh, I'm going to show you a video in a second of another journalist failing to play the game correctly. Different, different guy. And he has a problem with this instruction. So the parry slap means when you jump and you hit, you see a pink thing. If you hit the button at the right time, you can, you can jump. So you jump, touch the pink thing, and jump again. That's a, one of the game's mechanics. But the way it describes it, press jump when airborne to nullify or interact. What? What does nullify or interact mean? I don't know. So again, the language they've used, small issues. Nullify or interact are not really the sorts of language a gamer may use. Um, would you be comfortable, comfortable with that language, nullify or interact? I don't know. Maybe you are. That's why. You're, um, this also builds your super meter, which is not introduced. Your super meter is this. And they've never talked about it at all. They've never mentioned it, never drawn your attention to it. So this complex instruction, language you don't understand, with pink objects. The issue here is, this pink object, the round circle, they don't look like this in the game. You'll see it in a second. So again, lots of confusion here. Is it the best way of designing a tutorial? Well, no, as you'll see. So look at the list of UX issues that that tutorial made. They, the language failed to describe precisely what they, were what they were intending. How high is high? We don't tell you. No opportunity to practice the high jump because it was too high. They could have had another uh, jump first of all, low, high, and then the super high one, which would have solved the problem. But they chose not to do that. They assume knowledge. You know what dash is. If you don't know what dash is, you'll, you'll be in trouble. The chaining of instructions. You have to do A, then Y. You have to jump and go across at the same time. Visual design, setting expectation, out of uh, bad context, for example. Again, and the last one, memory, memory overload. I'm sure you've done this on your HCI class. But pushing all these instructions into the player's brain and then expecting them to recall it when needed, it's very unlikely. Very, very unlikely to happen. So this is obviously many, many issues. And each one is seemingly very, very small. But when you add them all together, it was a massive problem for this player. And this will happen in the software you design or the, the games you make. You may say that an issue is small, and maybe I'll not fix that. But if you've got enough small issues, it will be a massive problem for you. And this is often the problem in, in leading video games. It's not one thing that makes them terrible. It's hundreds of small things that come together, and the player says, you know what, I'll play something else. It's, I just don't get it. So here's the second journalist. Uh, this is the real game. This is Cuphead, not the tutorial, but the actual gameplay. And in this video, uh, he's talking over the top. So the games journalist has recorded himself playing the game, and he's putting it on YouTube, and he's talking and narrating. The talking is not important. I just want you to watch the guy. So what he's doing is playing the game and shooting along, and in a second, you'll see the pink objects. The pink objects that were in the tutorial, these things, they are pink, and you can't shoot them. You're meant to jump and parry them, the parry move. And here again, he tries to shoot it. He's not doing the parry move that the tutorial taught him. And one of the reasons is, well, there's two things going on here. 
the difference between the spiky ball, it doesn't look like the round ball that the tutorial taught you. They're not the same, and he did not recognize it. The second problem is, while he's playing the game, his attention is fully occupied. He is so busy playing the game that he doesn't have the bandwidth to also associate that this spiky ball is the same thing as the round thing. So again, there was two issues really coming together here to, to cause this guy a problem. He did not play the game correctly. He's not playing it the way the designers want. And he only recognized this when he was looking at himself <coughs> playing back. So when he played the game the first time, he did not know there was a problem. But when he had more bandwidth available, more mental bandwidth, more attention available to him, he said, ah, I've made a mistake. So here you have two experienced journalists completely failing to play this game because of the poor tutorial design. Now, maybe you all had no problem with it. That's great. You're all expert players. Maybe you overcome it. But bear in mind, I'm showing you a game that's very good. This game got high reviews. But we're wondering, why didn't they do a better job? Why has that happened? So this one screen, just going back to the first journalist, this one screen where he was over one minute just trying to, to jump, there were six issues, six user experience issues on this one tiny screen. Uh, and this is often the problem in video games or most apps where it's not one issue, as I say, it's the multiple issues coming together. Really small stuff. <coughs> Holding for the high jump, the visual reinforcement. This looks like the high jump. Not true. Um, the language that's assumed, the, 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 the genre language, you have to know what dash is. Not true. The bad example. Not relevant. Um, the chaining of commands that you have to jump and dash at the same time, which it doesn't really explain to you. That's a problem as well. Um, and the fact you have to use this block to reach the higher block. So this is why, this is why the designer, uh, the journalist had a problem. It was all of these things confusing him at exactly the same moment. Uh, and later on in the lecture, you'll see uh, there's a popular uh, psychological model that that justifies this or helps explain this. And maybe you've covered it in the lectures, I don't know, but we'll show it again anyway. So it's all these things coming together. It's often a critical issue in video games, why players leave. It's not one thing. Um, well, usually, usually. So if I was marking this guy, um, D minus, not so good. The game, awesome, uh, very good game you've made. Your ability to tell a player how to play your game is awful. It is not the best you could have done. So get back to this point. Why did no one say the designers failed? Why is it in our culture to blame the player? You're not good enough for our game. Now I know in this genre, <coughs> that's the sort of game it is. You want to punish the player. So I see why the internet did it. You want to say that I'm better than that. I can do it. Look how great I am. However, the, the principle remains. So that was um, uh, kind of in instruction design or instructional design, trying to teach the player how to play your game. What about UI design? Now, UI is seemingly, uh, arguably, easier. Um, I, I know that could be a, a long discussion, but uh, let's look at four popular base builders. So we spent one year, uh, let's see if this works. So we have uh, Clash of Clans, uh, Boom Beach, we have Game of War Fire Rage, and Star Wars Commander. So with three good base builders, I know this is debatable, I know, I know. With three good base builders and then Star Wars, which isn't quite as good. Star Wars is not, is not as successful as these other three. But what's interesting about Star Wars uh, Commander, this came out after those three games. So they, they could have learned from what came before. They had the Star Wars IP. So you've got games that are successful and the Star Wars IP, this is the recipe for a billion dollar franchise or a billion dollar game. And it didn't work. It did not work. How can you mess that up? How can you not learn from three other games and take a very, very famous IP, Star Wars, and not turn it into a successful game? Well, we just looked at the first hour of gameplay. What, is the, what are these games doing to try and get the player into the game? Why does one game feel good, but the other games feel mm, not quite so good? Why when you make software, when someone uses it, might the user say, eh, that's okay. 
but they'll use somebody else's software and think, I love it, it's great. There's a reason for it. And if you dig deep enough, you will find the reasons. If you pay enough attention, you will find the reasons. Star Wars, the developers of this game, definitely did not pay enough attention uh, to understand why these games were successful in terms of the user experience. But we're going to look at a few simple things. Um, and the first one, if you play any mobile games, uh, this one's relating to player trust. If you're going to ask the player to give you money in a free-to-play game, you better have their trust. So one of the first things that many mobile games do is they send out a notification when you open the app. And it says, we would like to send you, you know, a reminder, a notification. And it's something generic. This may include alerts, sounds, and icon badges. This is the one that most games, even in 2018, will send you this. This is possibly the worst thing to show you. You've just downloaded the game. You open it for the first time. And it says, hey, can we bug you? Can we send you things that you don't even know? And what do most of you do? Don't allow. No, you may not send me junk. Thank you very much. Why would you click OK? You've just downloaded it. It could be a terrible game. Why would you grant it permission to bug you? Most people do not click OK. Now, you may think, so what? What's the big deal? It's a massive deal because this button, this OK button, relates to retention. Players are much more likely to come back if you send a reminder at the right time saying your troops are being attacked. You should go and make a decision, create an action. But if you've clicked that button that says don't allow, you'll never get it. So most mobile companies are fascinated with retention and they measure day one, day seven, and day 30. So are people coming back the next day, the next week, the next month? Supercell talk about day 1000 years in. So their games are designed to be played th at least three years. Most mobile companies aren't like Supercell though. So this thing, this, this simple, very simple instruction to the player, which is often the first thing you see, is nearly always awful. This is how a programmer thinks. Have I showed the notification box? Yes. This is how people who care about players think. I know you can't read that at the minute. But this is actually Star Wars Commander, the game which is arguably the worst. But it does some things well. And this dialogue basically says, would you like a field report? This will help you make better decisions and play the game more successfully. Yes, I would like that. A field report sounds like something I'm interested in. I want to play the game more successfully. And this is exactly the same as this. This says, please turn on notifications, please allow it. But it tells you why. Turn it on because you'll be more successful. We'll give you the information when you need it, which will help you make better decisions and win playing the game. Would you like that? I would love that. Please turn it on. So this company understood, <laughs> briefly, players. They wanted you to do this thing because they want you coming back. They want you having the right information. This is programmer. This is UX. That's, they're the same thing, but how you think about it this one is going to be massively more successful because it told you why you should care. <coughs> Isn't that what you want? Tell me why I should care about your game, about your software. If you don't tell me why I should care, I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. And that's what this said. We don't care about you. Can we bug you? No, you cannot. Uh, and still, again, in 2018, some of the major companies are still doing things like this. Again, very, very small issue, a notification issue. Most people wouldn't even care about it. But it's directly related to the success of your game. It's related to how many people are playing your game, how long they play, how many sessions. It's the first engagement, the first thing they care about, the first thing they see. Do you want to frustrate them, or do you want to give them enjoyment? You choose. It's the same thing. OK, so that was trust issue. What about memory? So when you're playing these games, you're making lots of decisions. And you don't want to make the wrong decision. So this is um, Star Wars Commander. And when you start to play the game, you get some consumables, in-game uh, currency to, to use, or in-game objects to play in the game. And the thing about Star Wars Commander is, on the UI, it places this object right beside this object. 
But what's interesting is these work completely differently. So this is an object you will get. Uh, you can place it on the, on the map. And this is a consumable that works completely different. You maybe only get to use it once, then it's gone. And if you click on it and use it, and it's the wrong time, or you use it the wrong way, which is possible, it's gone. You've, you've lost it. Boom Beach, uh, almost doing the same thing. It separates them visually. These objects, which work like this, are on this side of the screen. And your consumables, which are expensive and you've bought, and you can lose them, well, they're over here. We do not want you using these things accidentally, because if you click on it and lose it, you'll be really annoyed. And we don't want you being annoyed with the game, because you'll stop playing. And by the way, you spend currency on these. In-game currency, real currency, whatever it might be. So this game understood, if players do this accidentally, it's a very bad position to be in. The Star Wars Commander people said, well, what's wrong with that? Again, thinking like a programmer, thinking like the player. They both technically work. But this one, you're much more likely to make an error, much more likely, and be frustrated with the game. And this one, it's very hard to make an error. They're completely on separate edge sides of the screen. These troops behave like this. These troops behave like this. Again, these may seem like small details, but the small details is exactly what we're interested in. Do you want your players to feel frustrated, annoyed, making the wrong decision, wasting in-game currency? Imagine if I played for two weeks to get enough um, money to buy an object, and then I wasted it within three seconds. Would you feel happy about that? I wouldn't. Many players wouldn't. So why, why take that chance? So again, why would that happen? Why would someone choose to do that? When there's a, there's a completely separate solution, an easy solution, or a fix for that. This is why this is a billion dollar franchise, and this one, well, it's interesting. Some more UI decisions. Um, Oddly enough, this example, both games come from the same company, Supercell. So this was Boom Beach. And in Boom Beach, actually, let's look at Clash of Clans first. These are some of the objects you can use in Clash of Clans. And these are potions, blue, orange, and green potion. So what? What's the problem there? Well, the problem is they all look the same. So imagine you're making a decision. Do I want to apply the orange one or the green one or the blue one? Damn, I can't remember, because they all look really, really similar. And if I use the wrong one, something else will happen. So why would you choose to do that? So their second game, Boom Beach, well, not their second game, but the game after that, this is the same sort of thing. The first aid kit looks like a first aid kit. You get an idea of what it will do, or the flare, or the bomb. They change the visual representation so that the player is more likely to know what they will do. They're trying to help you make a better decision. You paid for these things, they're consumables. But again, this is quite poor. Visually very good design, the artist has done a good job, but they've not understood anything about how the player works. This is poor. Visually good, usability, really awful. Visually good, usability, really good. Which one's the player likely to make the better decision with? Which one's the player likely to feel more relaxed with? It's this stuff. Last one, I think. Um, it's around decision making and friction. So back to Star Wars. Uh, look at all these ships. These are all completely different, and you're meant to use them in different ways depending on your strategy. Fair enough, that's how strategy games work. But unless you're a real Star Wars nerd, um, these are really, really hard to differentiate. Imagine you're trying to make a decision, and you have to apply one of these or use one. Are you, the chances of you playing the wrong one is reasonable. You may do that a few times at least. Oh, I didn't mean to click that. Maybe I meant that one. So these are on brand. You could imagine that the Star Wars people said, you can't change the representation. They must look like this. And the artist has done a very good job. This is very, very good. They look just like the real, well, the real thing, the movies. But from the user's perspective, which one do I use? It's very difficult to decide. They all have the same color background. They're all kind of the same, same size shape or size. They're not taking into some of the properties that we would think about, about user, user interface elements. 
Same problem as this, just going back. They're all the same shape and size. The silhouettes are almost identical. Whereas the silhouettes, even the outline, if you just get rid of the colors, these are visually distinct. So again, some of the properties we think of of user interface elements. Texture, uh, the silhouette, um, the shape, the color. Different ways of representing it. The multimodal nature of objects. This is very, very strong. This is very, very weak. Very, very weak. Weak design. But again, someone decided that's good enough. Nobody bothered saying, nowhere near good enough. This is terrible design. You're not thinking like the player. You're thinking like an artist. You know, have I done my job by drawing these, these objects? Tick. Yes. Fine. That's not what video games are. You have to think like the player. Can the player make the decision in a quick enough time with no error? Probably not. Probably not. So just some of the things that these base builders, I mean, most of these games are good. Again, we've chosen games which are at the very, very top of the iOS charts. The games that are much further down, we could talk all day about the mistakes they made. So we're trying to find the mistakes in the best games going. And they have them. They definitely have them. So think like the player. Have you got their trust? Can you reduce the memory overload? Why make them remember stuff? Isn't it easier to recognize? It is. Why don't you use that? These games are making the most fundamental mistakes in, in usability. Why does that happen? Um, this one's going to be harder to demonstrate because it's about feeling. Um, so it's an iOS game. Has anyone played twin stick shooters on iOS? Any twin stick shooter fans? Really? You're being, you're being shy, I think. Oh, okay, there's one. Okay. So a twin stick shooter, you'll see in a second. Uh, if you haven't played a twin stick shooter, this thumb does movement of your character, and this one will shoot in that direction. So if I get my thumb and move it in that direction, the gun will shoot up there. So move, shoot. It's a very popular genre on pretty much every platform, from Xbox to well, all platforms. So what's interesting about this particular problem is it's an interaction design problem. So before we were talking about instruction design tutorials, we saw how Cuphead did a pretty bad job of explaining to the player. With the base builders, we saw UI problems that they just were very good at understanding what good UI actually meant. This is an interaction design problem. In other words, controls. How do you move the character on the screen? And this, this company, uh, the game is good. It's got good reviews. That's why I chose it. Um, but it's not perfect. And what's most interesting about this example is the company built three different control schemes, three different ways to control the character. And none of them are the best way of doing it. None of them. So they built three, and none are perfect. But the fourth way, the, one, the way they should have done it, you could have proved it almost algorithmically, like mathematically, before any code was written. So when I see a company make these mistakes, all I see is they don't understand interaction design because it's a mathematical problem, as you'll see. So where do we go? When you download this game, it's called Atomine. Maybe, maybe say that. Atomine. Uh, it's a I don't think it's free, but anyway. Um, this is what they call normal controls. I don't know what normal means either. Normal, normal to them. Uh, they should have really not called it that, but there we go, we have normal. So the player drops in, uh, and this is, you can see how the controls work. You, can, you move your thumb around, and the, the character moves. You can see it, this, is an, this is an iPad. If you take your th thumb off the screen and put it down far away, it draws a new circle. So if I put my thumb far enough away, the game draws a new circle. You get the idea. Now, I know it's hard to explain the differences why this is a problem, but you'll see why at the end. All you will know as the player is that the controls are pretty good, but something doesn't feel quite right. And when something doesn't feel quite right, it happens when you take your thumb off the screen. Something happens which is just different. When I read the reviews for this game, they all said the controls were brilliant, great. I would not say that. There's a flaw. So that was normal controls. That's, what the, that's the way they want you to play it. And it's pretty good. But again, I'm not interested in pretty good. I'm interested in brilliant, the best. And it's not the best. 
The second one they call static controls. I don't even know why they designed this because these are always the worst possible way of doing it. These are awful. But they have it as an option. Take it for what it's worth. And static, I think it's going to start. The static control means these circles, they never move. So I can take my thumb off and move it a far distance away, but the circles will remain on the screen in fixed positions. Again, if you're interested in interaction design, one of the disciplines underneath UX, you will see why this is a problem. And sometimes the character will judder when you take your thumb off, your, your thumb off and put it back on. It doesn't result in fluid movement because the chances of you putting your finger back down in the same spot it came off is low. It doesn't do that. So again, this is okay. The game technically works. Programmer done a job, good for them. Have they done it the best way possible? Not even close, not even close. The third way they chose to do it, and I thought they'd solve the problem. This is so close to being perfect. They call it hidden controls. And that's how you solve the problem. And what it means is, when you take your thumb off the screen uh, and put it back down, if it's a big enough distance away, you redraw the center point every time. So your thumb always touches the center every single time, and the camera doesn't move. This is perfection. This is smooth controls. And I thought they'd fixed it. And then they messed up. And that was odd. So you can see here I take my thumb off the screen, and I put it down different places, which is halfway to solving the problem. I'll just let the video play a second. So whilst there are three control schemes, and you may say, so what? They all look kind of the same. But there's a massive difference in terms of how they feel. And again, um, this is all solved with an algorithm. This could have been done on paper long before code was written. And they didn't do it. They spent their time and money programming three different control schemes. And none of them are great. Here's the answer to the problem, by the way. So their first method was always visible. There's two things on the screen. You put your thumb down, and the character stays steady. You take your thumb off, and you still have a circle on the screen. OK. The problem is, if you put your finger down near the center, but not the center, this distance here, what happens is your character moves a few pixels, just like that. Really tiny amount. But that tiny amount is enough for you to th somehow think these controls aren't great. There's something wrong. And very few players would say anything, because it's, it's small. You just overlook it. But you know something doesn't feel right. This is sometimes the problem in interaction design, that it's hard to articulate the problem. I just know something's not right. The solution, and I thought they had it, was when you take your thumb off the screen, you stop drawing the circle. And that's what they did. That was great. The problem was, when you put your thumb back down, the solution to the problem is, that's the new center point every single time. You redraw the center point. And the camera never moves, ever. That's the new center. It's always center. Your character never moves. They didn't do that. When you put the thumb down, they kept the center point as the old one. And so you got this few pixels every single time. So that they almost saw the solution and then messed up at the last, at the last moment. The thing is, this article, I wrote an article for Gamma Sutra five years ago explaining all of that. This is for my article. I wrote it. I said, if you're designing twin stick controls, have it for free. Just stop designing crappy games. Just go and take it. Here's how you do it perfectly every time for twin stick controls. And in 2018, we've got a game which designed three of them, and none of them are none of them are great. So again, our design, our game designers looking to the past to learn from, to design the best possible way of making these individual components of games. Have we done the best UI, the best interaction design, the best user flow? No, we do not know from our past. We're not looking to our past. We're just programming. I can do that. I know how to make things on the screen. But you don't. You can put something on the screen, but you can't put the best thing on the screen. So again, you may say I'm nitpicking. Come on, seriously. This, you're going down the list level of interaction design. 
yeah, that's exactly what we do. Because this is good, like really good. So, so what? Why am I nitpicking? It's like, come on, these, are, these aren't major issues. How bad are UX issues in games? Well, when I was an academic, I had a master student analyze hundreds of game reviews. And what she did was take uh, these reviews, this is from Edge magazine, and she just coded, what do people talk about in game reviews? What do professionals mention? What do users mention? So there was a range of sources. There was, we looked at Gamma Sutra, we looked at Edge, we looked at Metacritic, both professional and user, all sorts of information. So when people talk about games, why do they say a game is good? And why do they say a game is terrible? What sort of things do we mention as gamers or professional journalists? And what it came down to was pretty much these five areas. So one was technical, like bugs or frame rate or stuff like that. But the other four areas were all to do with the user experience, how the game feels. And that's not surprising because that's why we play games, right? If it wasn't UX, that would be shocking. But that's what people talk about. So in these four areas, we had things like usability, which you know about the things we've been discussing. Can you teach the player? Does the player know? Is there affordance? Do you reduce memory, memory load? Do you, uh, you know, make use of recognition? Uh, interaction design, all that stuff. Um, game components, so what do you do in the game? Is it interesting? Is there depth? Is there replay value? The expectations of the genre. What, you designed a game in that genre, but you didn't do that? That's crazy. Happens all the time. And user emotions, the very reason why you play a game. How does it make you feel? How do the mechanics make you feel? So that's what these game journalists for, and users, us, were saying. This is the thing you're getting wrong or right. And they come up with every review. Every review is basically a UX review. So if they're not talking about frame rate or bugs, user experience. All of these things. I mentioned earlier about the, the, the Cuphead example. It wasn't one thing that caused Cuphead to fail. It was the combination of six issues at the one point in time that stopped the journalist playing the game. And this is the model um, from accident, accidents happening. So when a plane crashes, problem. The problem may be the boat sinks, the plane crashes, I don't know, the game fails, not enough downloads, not enough reviews, whatever your problem may be. This is also called the Swiss cheese model. Do you cover this in lectures, Swiss cheese? Anyway, it basically says when, stuff, when something bad happens, our game didn't get enough downloads. Why is that? Or we didn't make enough money, or whatever it may be. You need to split your problem into layers. And in the games industry, when free-to-play came out around 20, 2009, 2010, um, what most of the console game players were saying, or console designers were saying is, we know how to make good games, player experience, but we don't, we're not making any money. So maybe our problem is we just don't know how to balance the game in terms of finances, uh, the currency. And that wasn't true. The problem is, the problem is back here that the problem with their games all along through their whole career was how you teach the player how to play your game and the usability is terrible. In fact, it's always been terrible. But in PC world, or in PC uh, games or in console, you pay your 40 pounds or your, I don't know, 50 euro, and then that's it. They've got your money. Who cares, right? Free to play come out and basically said, you're not getting any money unless you make a good game. All of these problems back here came out. Oh, we don't actually understand people very well. So, the reason why they weren't making enough money here is because their game wasn't very good. Has anybody paid money for a really terrible game on purpose? Like, this game is terrible. I think I'll give them money. You probably haven't done that, I'm guessing. So, they're not making money because the games aren't very good. This is a free to play version. Why is the game no good? Well, the usability is terrible. The controls, the interface. Why is the interface terrible? Well, you probably don't know how to play it. How they taught you how to play it is probably quite poor. So in fact, all of their problems start here and they line up. This is the cuphead problem. All these problems line up. And the end result is, I don't like the game. Your player leaves. This thing you spent two years making, someone plays it for a minute and says, it's terrible. 
I hid it. I'll never touch it again. But I spent two years making it. Eh, whatever. I don't care. And your problem is not that your game design is terrible. A lot of these games, the idea is brilliant. The problem is how you taught the player to play your game. It sucks. And that's the most frustrating thing, that maybe games that could have been amazing have been cancelled. Not because the idea is terrible, but maybe the player said it's just not good enough. The, the test during the alpha stage or beta stage weren't, they weren't good enough. The company cancelled it. But what they needed was maybe to explain a bit better or change the UI or the onboarding or the controls or, I don't know, one of a million things. But maybe not the idea. The idea could have been brilliant. And this is the issue. Our game's not getting enough downloads. It's the idea. Kill the game. Where's the evidence for that? Metrics won't tell you that. The problem with analytics is it never explains these things. Because they're inside the player's head. And sadly, analytics will not tell you that. Does somebody understand how to play our game? I don't know. You have to speak to people. You have to watch them. Is it a number from you know, an anal analytics system? No. Let me tell you where the problem is. We have not enough people getting further into the game. But why it's happening? That's a human problem. And that's the thing they didn't do. They were all about the computer. We can measure it. We can put numbers on it. Well, you can put numbers on some things. But not other things. And that's the problem. The other way of looking at this is like a breakout game. where You want to get to the top. We want good stuff. People loving our game. High downloads. People praising you. You made that game? That's awesome. Love that game. But you're very unlikely to get there unless you take off all these layers beforehand. Why is your game interesting? Even the one line description. Describe your game to someone. Do they care? They, oh yeah, I've played something like that. Is it even unique? Because many games today just, just aren't. That can be a problem to begin with. Is someone even going to download it? Whew, that's tricky enough. Discoverability, arguably the video game industry's biggest problem. Will someone find your game? Probably not. <laughs> I'm sorry to break it, but they, it's difficult. Why would someone even bother to find your game or cover it or stream it or, or talk about it? That's really difficult. And even if they do that, you still have to get through all this stuff, you know? The video game industry is really, really tough. I forget how many, there's 500 games a day on the iOS store. Something like that. So 500 games today have been launched to compete against you every day. Every day of the year, 500 new ones are coming in. So your game better be pretty good if you want to compete at that, at that level. I know what you're saying. You're going to go on Steam. I know. I know. Steam is the same problem. Um, so why is this? Why this, to this whole thing, this UX thing? Why is the game industry like this then? If they make all these mistakes, why do they do that? Because it's avoidable, right? They could just make games a different way. The problem is when you speak to the games companies and you ask them about how they design their game, they talk about the creative process. They talk about generating ideas. This is the idea. This is the design of my game. This is the mechanics. This is the system point of view. In other words, they talk about this, only this bubble. But if you pick up any design book, I mean any design book, not just video games, but industrial design or anything, it's pretty much these three phases. You need to understand, you need to design based on the understanding, and then you need to measure. And you go around this loop until your idea is good enough and you release it to the market. Now I know some people have five bubbles or seven, they come in different shapes. I know, I know, I know. But these are most, the most common ones. You need to understand, you design based on the understanding, and then you measure it. So that, that twin stick shooter, for example, I was saying they didn't understand. They didn't take the time to understand the control scheme. They jumped straight to here. I can do that. I can put things on the screen. I can program. Awesome. Good for you. You can program one of the worst control schemes I've seen. Brilliant. If you had taken 10 minutes to bother understanding, you would have done a really good, well, you could have done a better, good, a better job if you question low enough level down to the individual click level. You will get there. Um, what about other games confusing UI? Why did they do that? Why didn't they understand that people don't think like that? People don't make decisions like that. It's because they don't take the time to understand. So more time thinking 
before you do. And I know it's completely obvious. You're students, you study this stuff. But the game industry, surprisingly, is very, very poor at understanding and very, very poor at measuring. How do we do? I don't know. We've got some sales figures. We've got some analytics. Do people like our game? I don't know. We've got a forum. Okay, that's the 0.1% of people who'll, you know, the rowdy ones who'll tell you nasty things. What about the average gamer who said nothing? Why did they stop playing your game? Well, you'll never know because they won't post on your forum. They won't put it on iTunes or Google Play. It just disappeared, along with all the information that will make you better. So again, if you only look at certain sources, you'll get a very skewed view of why you think your game succeeded or failed. Is it a representative view? Very unlikely. So this design process that's incredibly simple and completely common sense is not done by the vast majority of the games industry. And that's why when you read reviews, they say the games aren't very good. It's because the way they designed it is not very good. They didn't understand, they didn't measure. What they did was made up. And making a thing, all the evidence says, does not work out very well for the vast majority of companies. It does not work very well at all. Uh, I'm sure you've come across Don Norman in your, in your studies. Uh, if there's any mathematicians here, I know the formula doesn't work, but bear with me. So Don Norman says UX minus U, basically don't do it. If you're trying to do UX and you're not actually involving a human, you're not doing UX. That's called making stuff up. That's fine. That's got a place. But bear in mind it's not UX. The U in, U in UX is the user. So you, you can't ignore it. I'm so, sorry to say it. But you cannot. If you're saying you're doing UX, but you're not actually putting a real user in front of your game or your app, then you're doing something else. I know it's obvious, but there you go. So in player research, this is, what, this is how we work on video games. Um, I know it's a bit abstract, but these are the five layers I talked about earlier. These are the things that all the evidence says is the problem in video games. Players aren't interested. Players can't learn. Players are confused. Players don't like it. Players don't give you money. These are the things that are discussed. This is why we play games. So if all the data says these are the things that are important to, to making successful games and successful companies, these are the methods that we use at different times to polish these five layers. For example, if you want to polish the usability of your game, here are four methods, the biggest dot. Any of those four methods will polish the usability of your game or your app. Why is there four? Well, they happen at different points in the game development lifecycle. Uh, most game developers want to wait until they've made something and do a usability test. You could, but it's not the most successful method. You really want to be doing something during the concept stage. For example, what are your competitors doing well? Before you make something, go and look at the competition. This understanding phase of the design process. You need to be doing something before you just jump in and program. You'll do a better job. So again, you have four chances, four different methods at different points in time to give you a really solid understanding. Do people understand our game? Yes, we've done four different methods all the way across development life cycle. All the evidence says we are good to go. It's looking good. The idea of just waiting for a play test here is insanity. And one of the main reasons is it's hard to let go. If you discover that it's, you know, players don't get it, maybe you're just going to release anyway. It's too close to, you know, release date. We're releasing here with two months left. It's too late. We'll, we'll change some things. We'll put a little plaster on it. And, but are you going to make the best game you could have? Uh, it's very unlikely. So this, is this, this matrix basically says, we do not want game developers waiting until production before you start getting UX feedback. UX research starts the day you have the idea. The very, very idea. So often we bring players in to assess the appeal. We bring in 30 or 40 people. We show them your concept. We ask them why they're playing competitors' games. How did you find out about that game? Did you make a purchase? Were you satisfied with the purchase? If you did not make a purchase, why was that? You're understanding why people do what they do. Because you're going to make something just like that and hopefully make a successful game. Do many companies do that at the very beginning to understand, better understand their uh, users' motivations, designs, intentions? Not really. Not really. Again, any, any one method on its own is not perfect. 
but when you combine all of them together and do them all on your game, you're vastly increasing your chances of saying, I know how people will play this game. And if you only do one or two methods, you're starting to guess a bit more. We don't know. And why would you not want to know? Well, anyone played uh, Destiny? Destiny? Really? Oh, a few. Okay. So this is uh, the, the, the guy within uh, Bungie, the, the user researcher within Bungie. Uh, so they worked on Halo, he worked on Halo 2, and he said about 17 months before release, they did some play testing. And then a few months before release, they did lots more. So this is release date, and this is um, like four years, four years before release. So they learned for Halo 3 that we're going to start testing about 20 months before release, two years before release. We're going to start bringing in players to play test the game. So much more. For Destiny, they started four years before the game was released. Four years and just went all the way along. It made over a billion dollars, so it did pretty well. Um, but they didn't want to leave things to chance. So they're learning. This worked. Do it some more. This worked. Do it some more. By the way, we're taking more risks. We're making a new IP. The more risk you introduce, the more research you do. So yeah, even for the sequel, they still did more research, more playtesting. And for, um, I'm not sure if it's in this slide, but for this game also, they, did, they brought it back. The things they were doing back here, four years before release, was testing concept art. They were showing characters. How does this character move? What does that gun do? They haven't made it yet. It wasn't even you know, wasn't 3D modeled or anything. They were just showing it to people. What does this do? <coughs> and you know what? They were wrong. The players were guessing wrong. So even at the concept art stage, they were making mistakes that they could fix. It's only a drawing. Change it. If that had been 3D modeled and in code, would they change it? Well, it's going to cost us $50,000 to change. Maybe we just release it. But if it's on a bit of paper, yeah, sure, we can change that. Easy to let go. Uh, I'm going to... How much... Should I stop? You sure? No, I'm gonna, I'll stop soon. This is a very quick example. This is a PC game called Heat Signature. Uh, it was released a few months ago, I think. Uh, we worked on it in the very, very early stages of development. And the developer, he made a PC game called Gunpoint. Uh, it was his first game. It did very, very well. Made by one guy. This was his second game. Uh, and he said, I've got a new control scheme. And it's going to be great. So, completely different. And we just did one play test to say, well, does that control scheme work? It's very simple, right? He's got a new idea. He was going to release it, and we convinced him or explained that maybe he would want to test that before, before releasing it. So what he wanted to know was, does this control scheme work? And so we did a biscuit A-B test with humans. So you have WASD and mouse, or the new control scheme. And we basically said to players, try both, and then you can decide which one you like better. Very simple play test. But the upshot was the most interesting. Basically, nobody liked his new control scheme. The new version that he liked, players did not want it at all. But that was the version he was going to release in his game. He was convinced players would love it. And you know what? They didn't. But that's a success. Because that control scheme that wasn't very enjoyable to use, none of you will ever see it. When you download this, go this game today, you'll get WASD in the mouse, the thing you're already very familiar with. What you won't get is the terrible control scheme or the confusing control scheme that that was designed as an idea that could have been brilliant. You know what? It just didn't work out. It's no big deal. It happens all the time. But without playtesting, that was the control scheme that would have been there today. So th this is the thing you want to find out very, very early. Don't leave it till the end. He did it early enough where he was like, yeah, sure. Let's put it back. But if that had been one week, one month, two months before release, I don't know what would have happened. I don't know. Uh, Okay, we're near the end, I promise. We're near, near the end. Uh, so this is a UX class. Why, why do these kind of mistakes? We're back to this issue of why do developers do this? Why do they do this insanity of just making stuff and firing it onto Steam or putting it onto the Xbox store hoping that people buy it? Well, one of the questions I ask developers is how do you know your game's going to be successful? Simple question, right? How do you know? And one of the common responses I get is, well, We've got good programmers, good artists, good designers. So the chances of us making a good game is pretty reasonable. So they think something like this. They take the average of 
these are people, they're very smart, they're very talented, they've made games before, so we're going to get a, a 7 or 8. Yeah, we'll do okay. But the problem is, their design isn't, isn't up here, because their UX research is non-existent. It's terrible, there's none, almost zero. So the, the, the design talents that they think they have, in truth, it's much weaker, because no one's checking it. That, it's just a guess. The designers come up with an idea that they think will be fun to play. But UX research is meant to say, okay, how good is it? And if you don't do this, the chances of your game getting to an 8 is, like, it's rare. Rarely it can happen, but it's rare. And all this stuff, this UX research, it's saying, increase your chances of being successful. There's no guarantees. You can still make terrible games and do all this. It happens too but you want to increase your chances. This is about risk and doing better and understanding players and being a better designer, being a better programmer. All of this stuff is in here. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because you, you know it, but some people want to polish things. Uh, I sometimes give a case study of game designers who have lost their literally lost their house because they were making their own game engine and they forgot, they kind of forgot to make a good game. Like they were so busy with the technicalities of the game engine that the game was terrible and they had to sell their possessions to buy food. So this is the negative returns, which is you're making a game, it's good, it's good. You're starting to polish the game, mm, it's a bit better. If you keep polishing the same thing but at the cost of not doing something else, then that's a negative return. Overall, your game is getting worse. Yes, you're polishing the graphic engine. You're polishing or optimizing one thing. That bit is getting better, but your game as a whole is getting a lot worse because you're not giving your attention to the most important stuff. Uh, one th I think this is the last slide, by the way. But this is an example from one of the uh, Naughty Dog games. So I think, I think it was The Last of Us or Uncharted. I uh, can't remember which. But they had lots of problems on the game. I think it was Uncharted, actually, Uncharted 4. They had lots of problems on the game. And a producer was brought in from another uh, part of the company. And he was surprised what was going on. He said, why are you spending your time polishing a part of the game that's really good? But this other part is terrible. But that's what they were doing. So it needed that outside perspective to say, why, why are you polishing this thing? I'm sure you've all done it. I've certainly done it. You try and make something better because you know you can make it better. But you don't look at the whole picture. What's the thing I can do today that makes my gamer app better? Is it this thing I'm doing, or is it something else? And that's what's happening with some, well, a lot of video game companies. And UX research is meant to give you that outside perspective. When we produce our reports, that's like a ranked list of priority. Like developers sometimes tell us, oh, we, we recognize all these problems. You haven't told us anything new. And we're like, well, well, what are you going to change today? Is it the same thing that we put at the top? And they often say, well, no. We were going to change something else. And that's the negative return. They were going to change something that didn't need fixing. And they were going to leave something which definitely did need fixing. So it's not about uncovering necessarily a new issue, but prioritizing the issues that you already know. That's just as valuable. Time is short. I'm done. I promise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.